So hi, everyone. Thank you for making it out to the African American Center this Sunday. I'm Shauna Sherman, manager of the center. And I'm so grateful to have these two luminaries of black revolution in San Francisco here with us today, Dr. Oba Tashaka and Marvin X. Um, before we get started, I want to acknowledge that the library is located on the area now known as San Francisco, which is on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytu Shaloni peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the original peoples of this land, the Ramaytu Shaloni have never uh, lost nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place. And we recognize that we benefit from living, working, and learning on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we, are for, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytu community. As the African American Center, we also honor the gifts, resilience, and sacrifices of our black ancestors who, that, who toiled the land, built the institutions that established this city's wealth and freedom, and survived anti-black racism ne despite never being compensated nor fully realizing their own sovereignty. Because of their work, we are here and will invest in their legacy. We also acknowledge the exploitation of not only our labor, but of our humanity. And through education and outreach, we are working to repair some of the harms done by public and private actors. So again, once again, welcome to the center. This, this spot was established in 1996, along with the main library as a permanent space for um, promoting and celebrating the history of African American people within the city and across the country. Um, we host exhibits in this space, as you can see, which we're celebrating today, the tour of the Black, a black Aesthetic Exhibit, the photography of Kenneth e. P. Green Sr. from the 1960s and 70s, and we're also grateful to have Kenneth P. Green Jr. with us here tonight, the son of the photographer whose, feature, whose art, uh, images are featured in this exhibit. And we're here because of African Liberation Day, which was a march through the Fillmore District in May 27, 1972. And those are the images that you see around here. Um, to see more of what's going on at the center, please visit our table over there. We've got our Black Excellence bookmarks and flyers for upcoming programs, which I won't go into here. And before we get started with our presentation from our two esteemed guests, I'll give you a brief biography for each of them. So, poet, playwright, and essayist Marvin X was born Marvin E. Jackman on May 29, 1944 in Fowler, California. He grew up in Fresno, Oakland in an activist household. X attended Oakland City College, Merit, which is now Merritt College, where he was introduced to black nationalism and became friends with future Black Panther founders Huey P. Ne P. Newton and Bobby Seale. X earned a BA and an MBA in English from San Francisco State University and emerged as an important voice in the black arts movement, the artistic arm of the black power movement in the mid to late 60s. X wrote for many of BAM's key journals, including the black uh, Journal of Black Poetry was published here in San Francisco. And he also co-founded with playwright Ed Bowens and others two of BAM's premier West Coast headquarters and venues, Oakland's Black House. San Francisco Black House. Oh, San Francisco Black House and is it San Francisco Black Arts West Theater? Is yes. It? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. In 1967, X joined the Nation of Islam and became known as El Mu. Hajir. In the 80s, he organized the Melvin Black Forum on Human Rights and the first annual All Black Men's Conference. He also served as, as an aide to former Black Panther Eldridge Cleaver and attempted to create the Marvin X Center for the Study of World Religions. In 1999, X founded San Francisco's Recovery Theater. His production of One Day in the Life, the play he wrote about his drug addiction and recovery, became the longest running African American drama in Northern California. In 2004, in celebration of Black History Month, X produced the San Francisco Tenderloin Book Fair, also known as San Francisco Black Radical Book Fair, and University of Poetry. X has taught Black Studies, Drama, Creative Writing, Journalism, English, and Arabic at a variety of California universities and colleges, and he continues to work as an activist, educator, writer, and producer. 
and Dr. Obra Tishaka is a master spiritual scholar, warrior, strategist, master leader, organizer, professor, author, and public speaker. Dr. Tashaka is an organic scholar whose scholarship emerged out of the Black Liberation Movement of the 60s. During the course of his long life as a spiritual scholar warrior, no shadow has been thrown on his honor or character. He has been kind to his people and humanity through feeding the hungry, providing jobs for the fearlessness, for, 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 sorry, providing jobs for the poor, a roof over the heads of those in need, and a knowledge of self. His fearlessness has driven fear into the hearts of his people's enemies because oppressors fear uncompromising truth seekers who cannot be purchased for money, recognition, or a seat at the oppressor's table. In the course of organizing, Tashaka, then Bill Bradley, underwent an awakening that led him to realize that his mind was under remote control. This led him to undergo an awakening through a system of African identity transformation and an apprenticeship system of African transformation and, and an apprenticeship system of re-education under master's experiences that continue to this day. He is the author of The Integration Trap, The Generation Gap Caused by a Choice Between Two Cultures, The Art of Leadership, The Political Legacy of Malcolm X, and Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality. Both were around during 1972's African Liberation Day March through the film work. So please welcome Marvin X and Dr. Oba Tishaka. part that I want to deal with is the black aesthetic and then I will conclude with a partial reading of the speech that Dr. Walter Rodney gave at the African Liberation Day here in San Francisco. So basically what do we mean by the black aesthetic. Uh, what did we mean then and what do we mean now? And basically what I meant as a writer and playwright and director and producer of black theater, well, my dramatic career started at San Francisco State, but before that I attended Merritt College as she just said, and my first writings were published there in the college magazine and in a, another publication that was centered there called Soul Beat, one of the major critical publications of the Black Liberation Movement and the Black Arts Movement. And we need to be clear that there are pretty much indistinguishable. You know, we could walk and chew gum. So people that were radical activists were also artists and poets and dancers and painters and photographers. But we were activists. And essentially, that's the black aesthetic. It's about being involved as a artists, as opposed to the European concept of art for art's sake. Even though Mao Zedong talked about in his uh, pamphlet on art and literature at Yen and Forum, he talked about there's no such thing as art for art's sake. Art is either for the revolution or it's for the oppressor. Either you want to be a uh, Hollywood commercial, some type of freak, or you want to be a revolutionary, or in the words of uh, Paul Robeson, who had to make the decision whether he wanted to be uh, a lackey or whether he wanted to be an artistic freedom fighter. So he chose to be the artistic freedom fighter, and as a matter of fact, in honor of him, I entitled one of my collection of essays, Notes of an Artistic Freedom Fighter. So the, so the black aesthetic is about 
being an activist, artist, artist, activist, artistic freedom fighter. Your art is for the revolution. You're dedicated to the revolution. You're dedicated to freedom of death. Or uh, what's that poem, uh, If We Must Die, from the Harlem Renaissance that we use in the black liberation struggle. We use that poem by, uh, what's his name? If We Must Die. Uh, McKay. Claude. Anyway, that was the theme. That was the theme then and that was the theme now. That is the theme now. We're still here. We're still working on the black aesthetic. For example, uh, I was just talking to our brother the other day in the rehab the Honorable Dr. Nathan Hare, father of Black Studies, of the first Black Studies program in San Francisco State. And he was being interviewed by another professor and she was asking him about, uh, do you think Black Studies cured the, was a panacea for Black people? He said, no, <clears throat> no. And, and she said, well, have you, have you figured it out? Because first you said it was a, it was a cure-all for our, he said, no, there's many components to our liberation. Art is one of them, culture is one of them, economics, politics, on and on and on. It's no one thing. And he said, and I still haven't figured everything out at 91 years old. He still ain't figured it out. What is black studies and what is the significance of it? So art is all bound up in that. And this is what we were about. In 1972, I had a theater called Black Educational Theater on Webster between Fillmore and, on, excuse me, on O'Farrell between Fillmore and Webster, right where the Safeway is right now. And uh, we performed there and, and, and actually, uh, I was teaching at UC Berkeley. Sun Ra was teaching at UC Berkeley. And uh, for those who don't know who Sun Ra is, he's like, if you can imagine, who is the greatest avant-garde jazz musician that you can think of? And, think, and then, then think of somebody that's about 10 million miles ahead of them. Then you got Sun Ra. And he's also known as the father of Afrofuturism. You saw the movie Black Panther. That was basically about Afrofuturism, where you, like the Sankofa, you go to the past and come forward into the future. So Sun Ra was teaching at, at UC Berkeley, and he told me that I was going to be teaching at UC Berkeley. And I said, oh, Sun Ra, you're crazy. Ronald Reagan had just kicked me out of Fresno State, right? And the same year, he kicked Angela Davis out of UCLA for being a black communist, and he kicked me out for being a black Muslim. So I said, Sun Ra, you're crazy. Sun Ra said, no, uh, uh, the creators say you're going to be teaching at UC Berkeley. <laughs> and a few weeks later, I was teaching at UC Berkeley. <laughs> And then, of course, my off-campus theater was my theater on, on, on O'Farrell. And Sun Ra and his whole orchestra uh, worked with me and performed with me. And actually, I, I would say, as far as the black aesthetic, Sun Ra has given us the greatest expression of the black aesthetic because he combined all of the components of the arts, <laughs> music, drama, dance, poetry, costume, lights, sound, makeup, everything. He did it all. The greatest expression of what the black aesthetic is and what black theater is all about. So I was blessed to be, to work with him and, uh, and I recall our greatest production was at the Harding Theater on the Visadero, where we did a five hour concert with no intermission. If you can imagine, 
with a cast of about 50 people, including dancers, dancers, musicians, actors, and so forth. So this is the black aesthetic. I'm gonna cut it short because I wanna get to African Liberation Day and specifically Dr. Walter Rodney's speech that he gave on African Liberation Day. And I want Adam to come up and read the last few paragraphs of his speech. Are you ready, Adam? He was saying in 1972, here in San Francisco. Uh, if you don't know Walter Rodney, he was a writer, and one of his most famous books is How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Okay, we're gonna go to, we're gonna go to the last few paragraphs. Okay. And we'll start. There was another illusion which must be squashed, and that is that when we support Africa, we are supporting a foreign entity. We are escaping from the struggle here. But the support of Africa is merely an extension of the struggle here. The struggle is universal because the system of oppression is universal. The struggle is international. With black unity, must be international because we are the world's most authentic international people. We live, in, we live on every continent through no choice of our own. But when the enemy has created a system of production and a system of exploitation which rests upon our physical presence in the Americas, in Europe, and in Africa, we will use a dispersed presence to amount the tremendous international campaign to liquidate the struggle that has reduced us to the position which we are in now. Let me move towards a conclusion, brothers and sisters, a conclusion which asks you to bear in mind what this gathering symbolizes. It symbolizes a no to Nixon, a no to the murderous policies of Vietnam, a no to the United States companies which are investing and exploiting on the African continent, a no to NATO, which provides Portugal with wherewithal to bomb and blast our American brothers who are struggling for their rights in their own land. That must be an explicit no. It is also a yes. It is an affirmation. We are saying yes to the line which was developed by people like Marcus Garvey, W.E.B. Du Bois, George Padmore, Kwame Nkrumah, Patrice Lumumba, Franz Fanon, we are saying yes to the struggle in Africa today, which is led by such giants as Ahmad Sekou Touré, Julius Eure, and we are saying yes to the struggle in the part of the world. We are saying yes to the people like the Saladair brothers and the martyrs of Attica. This time is a symbolic act of coming together this is also a time for self-analysis and self-criticism and rededication. So we will go from here with a new strength. We will reconsider the nature of the domestic struggle and its relation to the international struggle. Moving forward, the realization that the system must fall. It must fall. Have no illusions about it. The system that was created within this country as it extends throughout the world is so immoral, so vicious that there was no compromise. There was no remedy, remedy except to banish it. 
So we will move out to contemplate in our various ways how to arrive at its destruction. As we move out, bear in mind a slogan which the brothers in Southern Africa use. They say, victory is certain, victory or death, because they are placing their lives on the line. The highest form of struggle. But they are saying, victory is certain, because we are the future. We are the repositories of the truth. We are the most exploited and the most oppressed and must our necessity be the repository of freedom. So let us join and reiterate that slogan of Southern Africa, victory or death, victory is certain power. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Adam. Now, before I turn it over to Dr. Shaka, I just want to say to those who don't know how Dr. Walter Rodney ended, he just told you victory or death. And Dr. Hare says in one of his writings, most often when you say victory or death, messing with the white man, you get death. Dr. Walter Rodney was the victim of an assassination in Guyana, South America, under the Fort Burnham regime. Someone handed him a transistor radio with a bomb in it. And this is how he departed. So you can think about victory or death. Liberty or death. Think about Gaza as I conclude. How many writers have been assassinated in Gaza? How many poets? How many scholars? How many reporters? How many nurses? How many doctors? But it don't matter. It's still victory or death. Thank you. Um, first, just to um piggyback on what you just said, the estimate of deaths in Gaza coming from Hamas has been a little over 30,000. That's a lie. There's no way that small a number of people could have been murdered under the rubble in which they've destroyed virtually all the housing in Gaza, all the hospitals, all the universities, everything. Uh, there has to be at least 200,000 people that have died and why would Hamas lie? Because if they tell the truth, they're going to incur the anger of their people, even though they righteously rose up against the Israelis who have been oppressing them for over 70 years, bombing them and everything else. And a little over a thousand Israelis were killed by Hamas. That's a sad thing. But to put it on the scale of genocide, what you're seeing in Gaza right now is genocide. And the United States government is as responsible as our uh, the Israelis. They're providing the weapons and even strategic advice. And uh, the President Biden is talking out of two sides of his mouth, saying that they, if they're going to invade in this last phase, they should do it without hurting people. The whole campaign was designed for ethnic cleansing, to remove the Palestinians from their land. Yes. That was the objective. And so the Israelis could come in and settle. And so this is this is part of, it's not only African Liberation Day, but the liberation of all people who are oppressed. And a lot of young black people, when they rose up in Ferguson, they had Palestinians there supporting them. And had they not been there, we'd still support them because it's a just cause. So I'm going to be talking about African Liberation Day, which I was a principal leader of after 1972 in the Bay Area. I'm going to be talking about its connection to Pan-Africanism because you won't understand what African Liberation Day means unless you understand the overall thrust of Pan-Africanism. And I'm going to be talking about African-American culture that gave birth to it. So in the introduction to me, uh, there was reference to um, me being both a scholar and a warrior and a spirit person. I San Francisco State and I went to Hastings Law School for two years. I underwent an awakening, which the introduction referred to, and uh, that was in the midst of leading 
the only successful black power, black freedom movement in the North, and you don't know nothing about it, it's the San Francisco Freedom Black Power Movement. There were a number of successes in the North, but none of them across the board. And I was privileged to lead that. And what did we accomplish? There were no jobs for black, brown, red, or yellow people in this city in 1960, after World War II. People of color were removed from wartime factory jobs, and you were out of it. If you weren't hustling, you didn't have a job. So when I became chair of San Francisco Corps in 1963, after my brainwashed six years in the Marine Reserves, <laughs> I didn't really know my enemy until towards the end. My um, commanding officer was Pete McClowski, who was the person that turned over the information that freed um, Geronimo Pratt, you know, to his attorneys. And he wanted me to go into officer training corps. I'm a soldier, but I was a brainwashed soldier at this point. I'd been a lieutenant colonel in the ROTC, second in command of all the units in San Francisco, the best Marine in my, I tried to be the best in anything I do. But by the time I got out, when he's offering me officer training uh, school, had I done that, I'd have been a different type of person. I said, hell no. My father had refused to fight in World War II. He went before the draft board and said, draft me. I ain't killing no Germans. They ain't got no Southern accent. They ain't lynched my men or raped my women. Draft me. I ain't killing no Japanese. They look just like me. Draft me and give me a gun. I will kill every redneck, blah, blah. Because he was prohibited from cursing in my house. He was a street cat. You know what I mean? Use brass knuckles because he was five foot eight. And he'd go up against these big guys and stuff like that. So I grew out of this movement that beat all the major corporate institutions, the banks, the Bank of America. After we whipped them, the biggest bank in the world, Wells Fargo called me and said, if you could beat the Bank of America, the biggest bank in the world, we're caving in. The supermarkets, over 500 of them in terms of Safeway, those are labor jobs. When I walk into those now and I see people of color, those are jobs that we produce. Luckies, uh, downtown department stores, uh, the hotel and restaurant industry, auto road, but you haven't heard about this. Yeah. And it is a paradigm for how people can move more effectively because today it's over 130 million people in this country who are poor, 130 million. That's almost half the population of the United States. You hear me? And everything is going into the rich. San Francisco looks nice because it's condos for the rich. Where is there anything for the poor? And what is your mayor doing about it? You hear me? So this is my birthplace. I re-educated myself out of that, threw away not only the information that I've been miseducated on, but the methodology, you hear me? To try and be what you believe. In African culture, to know the truth is to be the truth. So this is my origin. And in 1966, after the, um, this was a Congress of Racial Equality, we formed the Pan-African People's Organization, and that organization would be the leader, among other things, of African Liberation Day. That organization runs an independent black school that has been in operation since 1972. My former students, who I recruited at San Francisco State, when I was hired at State, the FBI tried to knock me out they tried to assess. FBI tried to kill me two times. CIA tried to kill me once. It ain't no accident that they didn't succeed because I've studied low intensity. I've studied counterintelligence program. And then our people are well trained. And I recruited the smartest people in my class, all of whom thought they were smarter than me. And they were in their area, science, math, this kind of stuff. And they're still working. Margaret knows some of them. You know, Ustadi Kaduri, Dabidi M. Tambuzi, uh, Fanya McKinney, there's a bunch of them, you hear me? And they've been with me for 50 years. By the way, when you got people that long, it's very unlikely any of them were sleeper agents. <laughs> but we then had a transformational system as well. Now, in terms of the organization of African Liberation Day, it starts organizationally April 15, 1958, when Kwame Nkrumah, who became the first uh, head of an African state after the Sudan. The Sudan received their independence first. He called 
a meeting of African states in Ghana. Kwame Nkrumah, how many people have heard of him? He's one of the greatest visionaries that Africa produced. And he was trained in the United States at Lincoln University. He went to the uh, study groups that blacks organized. I apprenticed under John Henry Clark. How many people have heard of him? Uh, there, John Henry Clark's one of our greatest scholars. If you go to my show, I have a show called The Dr. Over Tashaka Show. Go to it. Uh, that show has about 186 shows that we've done in three years. And one is on Professor John Henry Clark. So they helped shape his political orientation while he was here in the United States. So it was at this meeting, April the 15th, 1958, in Accra, Ghana, that uh, Prime Minister Kwame Nkrumah brought together those few states that were independent in Africa to assess where was Africa at in terms of its independence. Because Kwame Nkrumah said that no part of Africa will be free until all of it is free. So he gave his country as a base area for training liberation movement activists. Then in May 25th, 1963, when two thirds of the African continent was independent politically, but not economically, we still are under neo-colonialism, that is economic control. Then there was a meeting held in Addis Ababa, headed by Emperor Haile Selassie, who was the emperor of Ethiopia. And at this meeting, the Organization of African Unity was created. Now, Malcolm X, um, a year later, would be in Africa and would be allowed to present a petition to the Organization of African Unity and would form an organization called the Organization of Afro-American Unity. It was my privilege to meet with him for three hours in a leadership meeting in the midst of the San Francisco Freedom Movement in 1963, in the summer of 1963, just before the FBI and corrupt leaders in the Nation of Islam expelled him and set him up for assassination. So at this meeting of the Organization of African Unity, um, the main objective was for the support of the independence of Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, Angola, Mozambique, South Africa, Guinea-Bissau, and Cape Verde. These are the areas of Africa that were still under colonial rule, and they were not gonna get free except through armed struggle. Because the Portuguese, they had not been bombed out in World War II, they had one of the weakest economies, but they felt that they couldn't survive unless they could suck the blood of Africa. So, uh, and, and the same thing with South Africa, until a lot of motion occurred in the ocean and put them in a different place. So, again, the main concern in the formation of the Organization of African Union um, was the independence of all of Africa and the support for the armed struggles in Africa. And so they called for Africa Day that later became called Africa Liberation Day. And they called on Africans from around the world to take up demonstrations and to petition their governments and to oppose the policies of Western governments, especially the United States, in supporting uh, colonialism in Africa. So this was the start of that. And um, this meeting was very important. Now this is a side note because I'm in this. I mean, I've, I didn't just write history, I've been in the history. And John Ray Clark was a master of mine. So he told me when Nkrumah had this meeting in uh, Ghana, um, he had a side meeting with um, John Henry Clark and others. And he was a practical joker. He had teeth that were so straight and so white, they looked like they weren't real. And mm -hmm. when he really got you in a joke or beat you in an argument, he'd say, I got you, ha ha, you know what I mean? So he had been sent by um, CLR James to um, Britain at the end of World War II and to hook up with a man named George Padmore. How many people have heard of him? Yeah, see, you should be taking notes, Padmore. His real name was Malcolm Nurse. He had been a colonel 
and the services of the Russians until in World War II, Stalin wanted to place uh, the interests of Russia above Africa, so he left that and he became a leading Pan-Africanist. And so he organized the Fifth Pan-African Congress. The Fifth Pan-African Congress was of a number of Congresses. The first was held in London in 1900 by a man named Sylvester Williams. He was a lawyer. He came from Trinidad. The two main places in which Pan-Africanism was created was in the United States and the Caribbean, and the main place in the Caribbean was Trinidad. Now the key thing to get straight about Pan-Africanism is it flows out of African-American and African-Caribbean culture. Pan, all Africans, meaning that all Africans should unite. See, a lot of us, we had this myth that they destroyed our culture and slavery. That is one of the worst things you can say. Dogs have a culture, you hear me? There ain't no way in the world they destroyed our culture. They attacked it and we rearranged it. It's a new African culture. It is the popular culture of the United States and of the world. We didn't just, the enslaved Africans, field blacks didn't just create a new African culture based on fundamental African principles. What were they? Spirit. What do you hear the average black person say? The spirit told me. What do you hear the average African say? The spirit told me. My best decisions have always come from the spirit. And the worst ones is when you don't listen to it. Am I telling the truth? Yes. Amen. You hear me? Huh? All people have the spirit inside of them. All of us are spirits in a body, but our culture is geared to that. And then this is a culture based on family, extended family communities, which they have attacked viciously since the 80s with placing drugs in the black community that the CIA admitted that they did. And this is a culture grounded in freedom. And that's where the arts come in, but it's all of us are artists in some way. One of my friends who would not be recognized as a great poet, but she was a poet. She said for black folks, poetry is a necessity because we're walking poets. We can rhyme on a dime. Talk about cool. You know nothing, know nothing cooler than that. By the way, you should watch the film Hoover. That's a good one, you know? Um, Fishburne, the best actor in Hollywood, period. Bar none, playing the role of a so-called gangster who beat the mafia. But it's the coolness of the culture. Because at that time, they were just dealing with the numbers. That's called the lottery. It gets to be illegal when we do it. When they're doing it, they make money off of it. It's legal. So you got to understand that African Liberation Day comes out of the vision of enslaved Africans who could not remember after a couple of gener three or four generations what part of Africa they came from, but they identified with all of it. And it started with Ethiopianism, the passage in the Bible that says, Princes shall come out of Egypt. Each of Ethiopia shall stretch forth its hand under God soon. Garvey was an Ethiopianist. That was the largest mass movement organized in the Western Hemisphere. You understand? Ethiopianism. So this idea of Pan-Africanism that inspired Kwame Nkrumah, he came to the United States to learn Pan-Africanism. And he was learning it at the feet of the, those who spoke and live African-American culture, and in this case, Pan-African culture, along with um, those from the Caribbean. So when C.L.R. James sends Kwame Nkrumah to uh, Britain, he's gone anywhere, but he gives him a letter. Nkrumah was smart enough not to give this letter to Padmore. <laughs> this is the practical joke he played at the conference in uh, uh, Ghana in 1958. But he goes to Britain and he helps George Padmore organize the Fifth Pan-African Congress. What was that? The most important meeting that Africans held in the 20th century. What conference plans the independence of a continent and succeeds in doing it? That was the Fifth Pan-African Congress. How many of you even knew about the Fifth, Fifth Pan-African Congress? And don't raise your hand if you didn't. See? Huh? You need to dig in some books and do your homework. How's our time, Doctor? 
Uh, I'm doing fine. You overtime? No. <laughs> In fact, you gave me 30 minutes, so I should do that. 10 minutes. Right. Go ahead. You were, you were very generous, brother. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm watching my time. All right. I told him I'd watch him. He's watching me. He was generous. And I appreciate it, Marvin. All right. I won't forget you for that. All right. Um, so what happens then is uh, Claudia Nkrumah is being trained in Pan-Africanism at the feet of one of the most advanced Pan-African thinkers who comes from Trinidad, George Padmore. Right. Padmore would then become his chief advisor when Nkrumah becomes president of Ghana. So when Nkrumah is playing a practical joke uh, at the meeting in Ghana in Accra, April 15, 1958, he pulls out this letter. He, he was smart enough to open it, and I'm sure after he read it, he ain't going to give it to Padmore. And this letter says, this is to introduce Kwame Francis in Kruman. Now, Francis would tell you, oh, there's a problem there. He's a Christian. <laughs> he says, he's somebody with promise, but a little backward. Maybe you can work with him, and he can do better. And so in Kruman, the practical joke was, I'm Prime Minister of Ghana. Uh, do you think that I'm a little backward, and then he goes, ha, ha, it was the big joke. So when we look at the Pan-African Congresses that occurred between the first in 1900 and the second, third, and fourth, they were held by W.B. Du Bois. And then the fifth Pan-African Congress uh, was held in 1945. Now, um, the Black Freedom and Black Power Movement would also move from the Black Freedom Movement and the Black Power Movement would move into a Pan-Africanist frame of reference through Black Power, through the Black Freedom Movement. Most people don't know Martin Luther King, the FBI had an FBI file on King on his relationship with Africa was thicker than his file on the Freedom Movement in the United States. King had more extensive contacts with African leaders than Malcolm did. Hmm. He was at Ghana's independence ceremony. Right. He was at the independence ceremony of Nigeria, Azikawa. Uh, and he was in constant collaboration with African leaders and he supported armed struggles in Africa. Uh -oh. He supported armed struggles in Vietnam. Why? He supported them where it was practical. He didn't support the United States because he figured the gunpowder was too great. The gunpowder, you know, that's the only reason. So we have to understand that Africa was inside of the Black Freedom Movement and both the young ones among us, when I woke up, that was basically drawn on Africa. That was enabling me to see who I am and drawing on African American culture. And those things are what really drove the movement. Now, the history of launching uh, African Liberation Day in the U.S., you have a picture in the back of a Wusu Sadakawa. That's a Wusu Sadakawa who's got the uh, dashiki on. Right. A Wusu Sadakawa was in charge of Malcolm X Liberation University. Right. It was a um, independent attempt to form a black university in the South. It was heavily financed through the General Convention Special Program of the Episcopal Church and my good friend, Howard Kwanda. I led the Black Nationalist Wing within CORE, and Kwanda controlled the money that went to black groups when James Foreman went before the Episcopal Church and demanded reparations. And so one of the things they did is they put quite a bit of money into the Malcolm X Liberation University, <coughs> led by Awusu Sadakawa. Awuso Sadakwe, in terms of launching ALD, African Liberation Day, uh, he went to Mozambique in uh, 1971, and this is where they're having an armed struggle. And he took a photographer along with him and got to see what was going on uh, in the armed struggle in Africa. Awuso was a good speaker and a smart person, and so uh, he comes back and convenes uh, a series of meetings where uh, by 1972, May 27, 1972, in Washington, D.C., African Liberation Day was launched. And he launched it on the premise that Africa 
was calling for the freedom of these colonies and was calling on Africans abroad to support this. And so in launching African Liberation Day, May 27, 1972 in Washington, DC, at that same time in Toronto, Canada, African Liberation Day was held. In the Caribbean, Antigua, Dominica, and Grenada, African Liberation Day was held, and in San Francisco. The African Liberation Day held in Washington, D.C. was over 40,000 people. That's the largest African Liberation Day that was held. The second largest would be in San Francisco. And the sister who was in charge of organizing African Liberation Day in 1972 was a sister named Belle B. Brooks. Right. And she had a core of radical left-oriented, Marxist-oriented sisters who did that, and they did a very good job and she deserves credit for having organized that. From 1973 on, the Pan-African People's Organization would take it over, and most of the ALDs then would take place in Oakland because the population was beginning to shift in Oakland. So you'll see right here, this is a newspaper that we put out called The African Awakener. We had our own printing press and our own building that we bought, 1553 Fulton Street, Malcolm X Unity House, uh, 5,800 square foot building. I bought it and gave it to the members. I put the down payment on it, the members then paid it off. Uh, so this is showing you 29,000 people. This is 1977. And the person who is one of the speakers at Actual Liberation Day, his picture is right here, is CLR James. This is the picture right here. C.L.R. James. Who knows who C.L.R. James was? Who knows who George Washington was? So you know who George Washington was, he ain't worth knowing. A slave master, an Indian killer, greedy, you know? This man is one of the fathers of Pan-Africanism. That's right. C.L.R. James. He wrote one of the greatest books on the Haitian Revolution. That's right. Black Jacobus. Everybody should read that book right now to understand what's going on in Haiti. I was privileged to have him stay at my house for one week, you know, while we were getting him ready for African Liberation Day. So, Papo took over, Pan African People's Organization took over African Liberation Day. We averaged 29,000 to 30,000 people a year, but the main thing we were doing at that point was providing material support for Africa. This was the point of African Liberation Day. Provide money, clothes, medical supplies, and political support by putting pressure on this government to back off their policies of supporting the reactionary governments in, you know, the Portuguese and uh, the South Africans and the rest of them. Um, then, following out of the um, African Liberation Day in 1974, the Sixth Pan-African Congress was held in Tanzania. And this is a picture of me, Alusa Sadakwe, and Amiri Baraka in a debate. I thought Baraka was a nationalist. He had just flipped to a mouse. And uh, uh, Alusa Sadakwe already had. So I was in the middle arguing both of them. I take this, I have it in a booklet, and guess who won? Because I actually read Marx. Uh, I respect Marx. I think his analysis on capitalism is correct. But I think he missed a few things like the profit of capitalism came from slavery. He missed that. He didn't study African culture. There's a whole, you know, communism is the highest stage for Marxism where everything's classless. Well, we had communalism. We had that, you understand? So why wouldn't you study societies where there were no rich and poor, you know? Where women were not being prostituted and children were not being abused. Why wouldn't you study that? So I like Marx. You know, I always say I'm not anti-Marxist. I just ain't no Marxist. In 1973, Pan-African People's Organization, I'm wrapping up, um, to do this work, we sent a work team to Tanzania. Three months. Uh, by the way, we're self-reliant. We don't take any money from anything other than black folks. And that's how you keep people straight. You know what I mean? Because he who pays the piper calls the tune. You know what that means? And you won't be dancing to Aretha Franklin and James Brown. 
you'll be dancing to some dead music. So this is, uh, this is a picture, these right here are pictures of us meeting uh, myself, it's a brother on the left, Marvin, he's from the United States, he was working in Tanzania. This was with the Southwest African People's Organization. So after we worked in the villages for three months with Julius Nereri's government, and Julius Nereri was the most visionary of Africa when it came to having a program for economic development. And by the way, uh, this same newspaper gives the account of our meeting with Julius Nereri in 1977, a three hour meeting where we brought a film of African Liberation Day and uh, a program to uh, build a program in Tanzania, actually put money in the bank and everything else. That was frustrated by the CIA. I know the operative who frustrated it, you know, still walking around. I know what it is, and I'm not telling you because there's <laughs> nothing you could do about it, you know. I'll wait until he dies and then I'll tell you, you know what I mean? Uh, but we went ahead anyway through Thabidian Tambuzi, who's a member and leader in Pan-African People's Organization, and set up a uh, place in Zanzibar, right on the ocean, where people can go and stay. And that's been in operation for over 25 years. So in conclusion, um, African Liberation Day is an expression of Pan-Africanism. It's an expression of African and African-American culture. It rests on the idea that real power will exist when we are able to unite as a people. And any kind of power after that is good as well. And I want to stress, it's only the African in America and the Caribbean that could see the call for African unity, because before that, Africa was too big for anybody to think about unifying it. And if you're talking about ancient African history or comedic history, it wasn't a transportation basis. No continent has ever been under the control of one people, you know? No continent. There has been the world that has been influenced by imperial powers, Genghis Khan, the British, the United States. By the way, the shortest rise in imperial power in history, 27 years, and America went into decline. As Malcolm X said, what makes them sad makes me glad. Yes. I'm glad to see them going down the tube. <laughs> Because the crap they're running around the world, huh? Yeah. They need to go. Okay. So that's in conclusion. Thank you. Marvin, I went one, one minute over. That's all right. Yeah. You're doing great, uh, Brother Saka. I appreciate you, and I appreciate your brevity. Because <laughs> I know we both can be long-winded. Thank you very much. And uh, I guess we want to have some Q&A. Is that it, uh, some Questions? Mm. Uh, I think I think I'm going to put something out here. Got a question? Got a comment? Who's got a question or comment? Comments? First, I'd just like to say uh, thank you both. Thank you both for such a wonderful... What's your name? My name is Kenneth P. Green okay. Jr. I, uh, my dad was the photographer that the exhibit here is on the wall and the toward uh, black aesthetic. Um, that's downstairs. That's downstairs, featuring black women and the African Liberation Day exhibit that's here on the third floor. Um, I'm proud to represent my dad's legacy being a social photographer in the 60s and 70s. And I'm a, I'm a 69 baby, so I'm the physical manifestation of the love and consciousness and awareness that both of these men um, so graciously so graciously just described to us. So I'm just, I'm filled, I'm full and rich, and I'm, I learned so much about who I am being that I'm from Oakland, from being in this room with um, so much wisdom, but more importantly, it helped me understand how spirit called me to curate questions. Got a comment? Who's got a question or comment? Comments? 
First, I'd just like to say uh, thank you both. Thank you both for such a wonderful. What, what's your name? My name is Kenneth P. Green. Okay. Jr. I uh, my dad was the photographer that the exhibit here is on the wall and the toward uh, black aesthetic. Um, that's downstairs. That's downstairs, featuring black women and the African Liberation Day exhibit that's here on the third floor. Um, I'm proud to represent my dad's legacy being a social photographer in the 60s and 70s. And I'm a, I'm a 69 baby, so I'm the physical manifestation of the love and consciousness and awareness that both of these men um, so graciously so graciously just described to us. So I'm just, I'm filled, I'm full and rich, and I'm, I learned so much about who I am, being that I'm from Oakland, from being in this room with um, so much wisdom. But more importantly, it helped me understand how spirit called me to curate, uh, co-curate, toward a black aesthetic exhibit featuring um, fashion, entertainment, and politics through the lens of my father, Kenneth P. Green Sr., who, who documented uh, life and culture uh, of black area of, of the Bay Area of black people. Oakland, Berkeley, San Francisco. My dad was the first black photographer hired at the Oakland Tribune in 1968, and he died with the camera in his hand, June 25, 1982. Uh, it's just moving because my entire life is is based on this exhibit, but it's also based on how I was raised in the town. And my heart, my mind, my consciousness is all based on um, that movement. Um, and this, it, and it's, it, it actually rang true why I felt that it was important to bring this discussion back to the table. Um, I, I, I would like to be here all day. <laughs> Someone else have a question, comment? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, hi, my name's Aaliyah, um, Aaliyah Brunette. Um, I have a few questions, if, if you would be okay with that. Um, are you, do you, would you all say that you are pan Africanists? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you, um, do you think Pan-Africanism has a uh, future today? And if so, what do you think is the future of Pan-Africanism? And what do you think is the future of Pan-Africanism given the uh, state of um, global finance uh, and American finance and uh, the economy? You want to say something? I can, I can say what I think. Uh, First of all, I'm a black nationalist and I'm a Pan-Africanist because we are in North America and we have a unique struggle and we are in a unique position because we're in the belly of the beast. We're in the snake's mouth. So we're in a position to do great damage to the snake and the dragon from our position. So we have to be cognizant of our power as North American Africans. And then, of course, the whole history that we just described shows the necessity of uniting with our brothers and sisters on the continent. But they're moving fast as they should to gain power. And we're not opposed to them, but we gotta help ourselves first and then you can help somebody else. We can help Africa. You, you can help yourself, but how can we help Africa? We walk around with our pants on our behind. Mm -hmm. And then Africa wants to imitate us? Mm -hmm. Are we leaders looking like that? I don't think that's leadership, but we have the potential. He mentioned the consciousness coming out of the Caribbean and coming out of North America, where we can be true leaders. 
with the consciousness that we have, that we so we can. Like I, my daughter, I have a daughter now that's in Accra, Ghana. She ain't planning on coming back here, except to get some more uh, worthless dollars that are needed at the moment before the, uh, all hell breaks loose and the dollar turns into what it really is, toilet paper. <laughs> but she's there, so I feel like I've, I've made my contribution to Pat African this <laughs> Okay, so I'll let him take it from there. Okay, um, you're asking that question for a reason. If you were talking to a Chinese person, they wouldn't be asking that question. They can see whatever they feel about China because you have some people who came from Taiwan who are against the mainland, you know what I mean? But they see a strong China. And uh, whether they like it or not, they're not gonna be asking that kind of question. <clears throat> but it's a good question because we've been taught so little about Africa, so little about our history, and so much about Mighty Whitey and how great their power is. So the first thing is, I'm a Pan-Africanist. I walk it, talk it, sleep it, drink it 24 hours a day. So what's the first value of Pan-Africanism? And I'm also a black nationalist. What's the value? It's the value of the culture first. And it's that culture that we took and flipped the script on, turned it into a new African culture. But if you're gonna be strong, you draw from the best features of your culture, both current, past, and what needs to happen in the future. So for me, the way I was able to get out of being a brainwashed student at San Francisco State. See, here's the thing about Western education. They don't educate you, they train you. Yes, You're not taught to think. You're put on remote control. You're thinking someone else's thoughts. That was my awakening when I realized I wasn't thinking my own thoughts. Yes, sir. And I'm no dummy. And I was getting ready to lead the major northern movement and didn't know myself, didn't know my enemy. And so I went into what one of our members, Stavidium Tambuzi, that I've just quoted, calls immersion. I immersed myself in the best features of our culture. And what did that mean? Throwing out those things that don't work. For example, right now, black youth are in a position that no youth uh, among blacks have been in before. Powerful forces hit the black community <laughs> since 68. Dr. Nathan Hare was the first to document the fact that the black family was undergoing the greatest erosion between 68 and the time he wrote his book on the black family, then in its history. For 100 years, 75% of our families were two-parent households. Contrary to the story that they killed our culture in slavery and killed our families, our families were strong. With hardly a cent to pay the rent, 75 out of 100 black families had a man and woman in it and most of them were taking care of business. But since those forces have hit our communities, today, we have gone from 75% two-parent households from 1865 to 1968 to 29% two-parent households. White people have gone from 75% two-parent households to 50%. And they have lost four years in life expectancy. See. The real secret of what the damage is being done to this country is neither Republicans or Democrats are telling you the truth. It's yes, neoliberalism. Yes, it's a globalization, which could give you a few great hip hoppers, a few people that could succeed under globalization, but for the majority of people, it gives them misery. And so you had all these good jobs, manufacturing jobs, shipped to China, shipped to Mexico. And what did you have? That was the main cause of the erosion of black families. And then you had drugs dropped into the community by the CIA and they admit it. Right. And then they'll give you a toll every day on how many people are being killed in Oakland, blah, blah, blah. Well, who's behind it? And every time you've had a peace movement among the hip hoppers, the police are the main ones in there to disrupt it yes, because they do not want to see this thing of us going under, stop it. 
So what's happened is these powerful external forces that have hit us in the form of globalization, in the form of breaking up black families and black communities, in the form of the prison industrial complex, and a host of other things, God told me this. This came from the light. These words I'm going to say right now are not my words. They're God's words. And it's the secret. It's the basis of my book, The Integration Trap, The Generation Gap. And these pieces come from God, caused by a choice between two cultures. And I found out now this doesn't just apply to black people. This applies to white people. This doesn't just apply to black people in the U.S. It applies to the Caribbean and Africa. You hear me? God gave me an answer. I would have never got on my own. What does that mean? We have these, this strong culture, but the hit that has come, and they didn't plan it this way. They never intended for a choice between two cultures. It's an unintended consequence because they do not think we have a culture. So a lot of us, we just love to hear this because we can praise white supremacy. By the way, you should quit using that word. Whites are in decline. There ain't no white supremacy anymore. China has, in fact, already displaced the United States economically. Almost everywhere in the world, right under their nose in South America, they've displaced Brazil's economy, the foremost trading partner in the world. In the backyard of the United States is not the United States. It is China. Let me interject here for a minute. I wrote a book called How to Recover from the Addiction of White Supremacy. Now, some smart black people emailed me before I even published the book and told me I should not call it white supremacy. They say call it white lunacy because they're crazy and they're not supreme. Or white savagery. White lunacy. Yeah. Okay, but Dr. Hare deconstructed that white supremacy. He said, you have white supremacy type one, them, and white supremacy type you, type two, you. Yeah, you suffer white supremacy type two. But go ahead, bro. Yeah, so the key point about this is this. America's in decline. I mean, don't you see it? You can't run down a street in your car without going into a pothole. You can't go into a school that looks halfway good unless it's for the rich. There ain't nothing here. I mean, this, this place is run down. Why? All the money is in the military industrial complex. That budget is over a trillion dollars. That's right. That goes for an enemy that never existed. Russia is not your enemy. I, I don't support Putin. I don't like Stalin. But the fact is, at the end of World War II, <laughs> Russia had defeated 200 German divisions. That's right. They won World War II, right. and they lost 27 million people. That's right. But then Truman comes into office and starts screaming that uh, the Russians are coming. The Russians are threatening you. But he would never say that in Europe because the Europeans knew the Russians had saved them. He ran it to the American public. And so what you have now, notice Biden every time he says, God bless America and God bless the truth. Would God bless the troops, killers? You think God's going to bless anybody that kills? I don't think so. So the key point is this, that the forces that have hit us have put us in a position and the youth have been the primary hit because you're the central target, but our people in general, of choosing between two cultures. But we don't know it. And so there are two significant areas in which the youth have been heavily hit. One, it, it's on values. But I want to stress this. The youth continue our culture. And in fact, with Black Lives Matter and the resistance movements that come from them, it indicates that not only is our culture strong, it's getting stronger. But the weakness is in two areas right now. Our old people always taught people before money. Where there's a choice between two cultures and the youth get a choice too often, it's money over people. Money over people. And yet, you ain't got no money. So why would it be over them? You ain't getting any either. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then the second one is the group versus the individual. The older blacks always said the individual is important, but the group comes first. Younger blacks have been programmed to believe that the individual comes first. These are not intentional choices, but based on the forces that have hit us, it has led some to take that position. But because of the brilliance and the improvisational qualities of African-American culture, the youth will solve that. So the final thing I'd say is this, America's in decline, 
it's going down. And the question is, what do we do to build ourselves up? That's right. What do we do to build the society up? And there's a long-term agenda. It has to be to restructure this society. That was King's agenda, from unjust to just. And for some of us, it's got to be, some of us, because the way it's going now, as America gets weak, you may well find a nation state emerging in the South among black people. Yes, that may, a nation state emerging in the South among black people because you have the largest concentration of blacks in the South. How will that happen as America gets weak? Huh? As it gets weak, there's a lot of things you can do. And guess what? They're getting weaker and weaker every day. Every day. There's a book by, what's his name, Charles K. Doe. Yeah, right. Remember? There's a book on the, what is it, Third Migration or something? Right. Third Migration, back to the South. Yeah. And blacks taking power. <coughs> and power. he's a New York Times reporter. Yes. Yeah. Political power. Charles Blow. That's the yeah, Charles Blow. Charles Blow. Mm -hmm. no, Charles, Charles Blow. Uh, did you say you had another question? I, I do. Okay, thank two you. Two more, that's okay. You got two more? Go ahead. Okay. Let her ask one. I can, okay. I got a question. Okay. Let her ask one. Um, and then just one more. Okay. One more. Do you think that, um, do you think that um, some people and some young people who uh, some might consider to be immature or childish, how do you think that they can contribute to Pan-Africanism? And, and do you, do you think that Pan-Africanists um, should include people like that, or should, um, do you think that those people can be a part of Pan-Africanism and kind of take Pan-Africanism into the future, or do you think that those people might be excluded from that movement? Are uh, you referring to black people? Uh, no. Black people? I'm not when I when I say young people who or people who might be immature. I, I I don't mean of any specific race. I mean just in general. Like there are some young people who might not have um, intellectual interests, who might have sort of immature behaviors um, or act in an immature way, who might mock scholarship or Pan Africanism. Um, and I'm wondering whether, I'm wondering how they, if you think that they can be included what in say is that, Africanism. What I'd say is, there's an awakening among the youth. And the younger you get, the greater the awakening. The 20 year olds are really waking up. I'm, I'm on this YouTube, Facebook stuff, dealing with a lot of young people and then seeing how the thing is moving. And I'm particularly referring to young black people. Now the way this works with other groups, I'll deal with this in a minute. What I would say is, that your generation and younger and slightly older, those in their 40s and 50s, who are some of the top leaders in Black Lives Matter, for example, but then others who are younger, um, they have sampled the best political thought that has come from our people. And they have come up with strategies. And if you watched it, you'll know. Those strategies produced voting Trump out of the White House. That was a movement that came from young blacks, and this is how it works. Our culture is the leading culture. Everybody else follows it. It's the culture of popular choice. When we go into motion, radical whites go into motion. Latinos go into motion. Native Americans go into motion. Can I prove it? According to the Minister of Culture of the Black Panther Party, he said, the American Indian Movement said they were inspired to form by the Black Panther Party. The Brown Berets. Where do you think they got the Berets from? Again, following the Black Panther Party. What I'm saying is, the way in which you, your youth generation influences others is through your culture and through acting properly. And by that I mean fighting the system that's oppressing you. So the final thing, there's a lot to this, I'll just give you one final thing. So what did the youth sample that was the heaviest thing they sampled? that really did Trump in, that did the right wing in. They're all saying that uh, it was the Jews who did it. They don't want to admit that black people had enough brains to pull this off. They sampled Ella Baker's group-centered leadership, which, by the way, comes out of what you call classless age-grade societies. These are societies in ancient Africa where there were no leaders. It goes back to hunter-gatherer societies. Ella Baker, how many people have heard of Ella Baker? 
the greatest, one of the two greatest organizers of the 60s, her and Malcolm, those are the two best. Ella Baker believed that the people could free themselves. She didn't believe that leaders had to come and give them direction and stuff like that. And with the breakdown that I just described that's happening in black communities, black youth are in a position now, they ain't gonna be listening to no single leader coming up here pointing them in any direction. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, they have come up with all of these different ways for groups to use the computer, use the internet, use all kinds of stuff to create formations and stuff. And that's what took Trump out of the White House. He's trying to stall in his legal appeals to get out of the jailhouse. But that was black youth that did that. You hear me? Black youth. Yeah. So black youth is in a lot better condition than a lot of people think. Yes. We just had one more question over here. Oh, yeah. okay. Thank you. Uh, what's your name? Yeah, we're going to move yeah, on. Lady, what's your name? Get out of here. Yeah. 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 We can talk after. after. Yeah. Thanks. Let's get out of here. It won't be all night. Greetings. <laughs> uh, uh, my question is. I first came in contact with Kwame uh, and Kuma by talk, reading. Talk a little louder. I first came in contact with Kwame and Kuma by reading Africa Must Unite in Revolutionary Warfare. In Revolutionary Warfare, the book gave a clear example that in order to make a change, not just you know, <coughs> something systematic or to the side, but make a prominent change. He believed that women was at the forefront because men didn't have the, not the tenacity or the ability, but they just couldn't really do the work that a woman could do at that time. My question is somewhat akin to what the first question was, was meant to be. And it is this, how can we amalgamate young black men to, at this day and age, to try to be a more dynamic force Instead of sagging their pants and smoking blunts and doing all that, thing, how can we at least educate them to, a, to an extent where they're more politically inclined, where a change can be made? I can say this. I say that we must return to manhood training <laughs> and womanhood training and there's no other way out of this <clears throat> until we have rites of passage for young men and young women to advance with consciousness and with reality of what's going on in the world because there's no excuse for us to be ignorant with a cell phone that has all the knowledge in the world that's got a white woman that will talk to you about everything she knows everything <laughs> And she got a sister if she don't know the answer. So there's no excuse for ignorance. The Bible says what? The people were destroyed for lack of knowledge. So our young men need knowledge. And they need to get it before they go to prison. Because all that's doing is, as Dr. Wade Noble said, the men are in prison and the women are in prison called universities. And some of them, I got three daughters, so I'm, I can't say nothing about women because they're smart women, intelligent women, great mothers, independent. But where is their black man? Locked down? Some, do you realize some women with MBAs and BAs are marrying men doing 30 to life? Yeah. You realize that? So what is the future? It's not going to be, uh, we, we appreciate brothers like Malcolm X, who was educated in prison. But come on, brothers need to get educated before they go to prison. As a Paul Cobb said, crack a book before you book for crack. Crack a book. As I said earlier, sometimes we, we so busy doing nothing. I call them black Russians. They rushing to do nothing. Where you going, man? Oh, man, I got, I'm, I'm, I'm in a hurry. You ain't going nowhere. You ain't going to do nothing when you get there. And all you're doing is spending your time on the cell phone talking about where you at. The question is, where you at? Mentally, where you at? So we got to get to some consciousness. 
I think it was John Henry Clark said the future, our future will be determined by uh, high morals and high consciousness. High morals and high consciousness. So that's what we need to be taught. What needs to be taught to our, our, our young men and women, both manhood training, womanhood training. That Woman King was a good movie, I think, to show you what needs to be done. And if the men can't do it, who's going to do it? The women going to do it. Somebody going to do it. So let's get it on. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And let's give our host a hand. Thank you. Thank you for this. You can do this more often, but as Shaka C, you need to be coming with your pen and notebook and recording everything and spreading the word and sharing the word. We're going to send out what we've done here today. It'll be on Facebook as soon as possible and YouTube. Okay? And I got some material to pass out you can take with you. Yeah. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Obertashaka and Marvin X. Great conversation. Take a chance to look at the Court of Black Aesthetic exhibit. It'll be up through April 21st, and it's also downstairs in our Jewett Gallery. But thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.